I'm here with Alexander McCurse, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Alexander, let's talk about the Irish elections once again. And uh, yes, and um, Sinn Féin is now, they've, they've got the go-ahead, I guess. They've got the green light now to try to form a government, and they're going to form a left government, a left-oriented government. Um, the final results are in. It was it was close. I mean, you can definitely say that Sinn Féin surged to, to a victory, but... Um, you know, the differences are definitely not to the point where you can have a majority or even a, a strong minority, I would say. So, I mean, there's going to have to be a lot of horse trading, at least between the left oriented parties to try and form a government, if they can even form a government. We, we don't know that. And it could actually take, I read it could actually take up to 90 days to get some, some kind of government in place. Now, um, I, I got an email from uh, a viewer, Michelle, and I thank her for that email. She directed me to a Dr. Steve Turley video. And I actually watch uh, Dr. Steve Turley. And he has a great channel, so I recommend it to, to everyone that's watching. I'm sure a lot of people are already subscribed to his channel. But he had an interesting take on the elections and on Sinn Féin. And he kind of described Sinn Féin's victory as something akin to like a Bernie Sanders victory in the United States. And he made it a point, and, and I'm paraphrasing a lot of his video. Once again, I recommend people go find that video. He was saying that a lot of what you see, a lot of the votes that have been funneled to Sinn Féin, especially in the, in, in the younger demographic, mm. which is struggling with a lot of economic problems, especially in the housing market. Yeah. And I think you've detailed, Alexander, how expensive and how difficult the, the housing market is in uh, Ireland and especially in Dublin. I mean, from mm. what I hear, the rents are no, through absolutely. the roof and mm. buying a home is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that vote gets funneled into Sinn Féin because you really don't have a counterbalance, a Trump type of, uh, of leader or a party that you'll see in, in uh, Hungary or in Italy or even a Le Pen. And as someone who's, who's Greek and who lives in Greece, and as you are uh, Greek, we really have the same dynamic in Greece as well. We really don't have a viable, vibrant, legitimate, conservative right party either. New democracy, which is in power now, is very much centrist. They're pretty much down the middle. I even say they even lean a little bit to the left at times. <laughs> and then, of course, you have, you know, cities on the radical left, which takes it to a whole different, you know, direction. But I definitely understood that analogy where he was comparing mm. Sinn Féin to what a Bernie administration or a Bernie presidency would mm. mean for the U.S. and how you also have a, a gap on the conservative right side of things. So that's why you have this mm. Sinn Féin surge. So, Alexander, what do you make of that analysis? What do you make of the government that's going to try and get formed in Ireland and anything else that you would like to comment on in relation to the video that we did the other day on the elections in uh, Ireland? I, I think the comment is extremely insightful. And that's, I think, exactly the point. If you are a Irish nationalist who is opposed to the EU, you have no one to vote for apart from Sinn Féin. Now, Sinn Féin may not be a strong anti-EU party, but it is the nearest thing you have in Ireland to a nationalist Eurosceptic party. It has been Eurosceptic and indeed anti-EU in the past. And it is, of course, within Ireland, the party that represents, if you like, Irish nationalism, all the way back to 1905, when it led the independent struggle against Britain. And of course, Sinn Féin is a very left-wing party. Of course, it has very left-wing policies. But I think in many respects, the comparison with Bernie Saunders is spot on. I think it would follow the same kind of, if you look at policies, if you actually unpack its policies, they're almost exactly the same. I mean, I, I think there's rather more solidity to Sinn Féin in the sense that it's, it's actually a party, whereas Bernie Saunders is a, is, is a movement led. Is a man and a movement. It's a yeah. man and a movement. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there is that difference. But, but in terms of policies, it's very much the same. I, by the way, don't think they're going to form a government. I mean, I don't think, I don't think they have the numbers. And I think uh, Fiona Foyle, which once upon a time, 
when it was led by people like the former Irish Prime Minister Eamon de, de Valera way back in the 60s, was a right-wing conservative Eurosceptic party, at least it would have been in those days. Um, it, 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 I mean, they are absolutely what you describe. They are middle of the road, globalist centrists, pro-EU, part of the EU establishment, very contented and happy with the way things are in Ireland now, un uninterested in the conditions of, you know, pe young people or people who find themselves on the wrong end of the housing ladder and all those sorts of things. Uh, um, absolutely, fully and completely integrated into the EU system. Of which Would you are. describe them as like a, a, a German CDU or Greece New Democracy type of well, party? They like are the, they, very they much are, down the middle. Absolutely. I mean, they, they are absolutely that. Uh, uh, new Democracy is exactly what they look like. I mean, the Greek New Democracy Party, I would hesitate to call them like the CDU because even though the ideologies are the same, and by the way, can I make it clear? I mean, Fianna Foyle likes to pretend it's the more right wing party. Fianna Gael likes to pretend it's the more left-wing party. There is, this, they are the same. I mean, it, it, it's almost impossible for me as an outsider to see that there is any difference between them. And that's also, I gather, the view increasingly of more and more people within Ireland itself. But I, the, the only reason I would say that they're slightly different from the CDU is that at least the CDU in Germany is in charge. I mean, it, it actually decides things in Europe. The role of Irish politicians, if they come from Fianna Foyle and Fine Gael, is that they just take orders, which is essentially what new democracy does in, in Greece. So I mean, there is no difference uh, between them. They are utterly, as I said, um, vassals, if you like, of, of the EU system. And it's increasingly clear that more and more people in Ireland as all over the EU, are very dissatisfied with this. Now, as I said, if there had been a Farage-type figure in Ireland, actually, I'm surprised in some ways that there isn't, but let's assume there had been, or an Orban figure, perhaps even more plausibly, uh, because, you know, Ireland has a particular history where you might have expected an Orban-type figure to emerge. I, I would have expected such a person to get it to gain a great deal more support, but there is no such person. So as I said, they vote Irish people who are opposed to that kind, to, to you know, to this sort of complex of uh, uh, um, European integration is globalist politics. They end up voting for Sinn Fein because they have nowhere else to go. Uh, may, may I add, actually, that you know, I, I, Sinn Fein is a left-wing party now. It hasn't always been at all times in its history. It's a point which I was, you know, on the tip of discussing in our previous video, but it would have been difficult to talk about it. But, you know, there have been times in its history when it's been a rather right-wing, very conservative Catholic nationalist movement. At the moment, it's not. Nowadays, it's become very much, I think, under the influence of people in Northern Ireland. The, you know, the, the leadership was, to some extent, reorganized around political leaders in Northern Ireland. It's become a left-wing party and a very radical left-wing party, but it has not always been so. And um, I, I think now though, it probably is settled for this and will be a left-wing party for the future. I don't think it will form the government. I don't think it has the numbers. I think we're going to see a stitch up again between uh, Fine Gael and Fianna Foyle. I think that uh, uh, they, they will find a way of keeping Sinn Féin out. And if Sinn Féin were to become the government, I don't think they'd be the government for very long. But having said that, if we disregard what Sinn Féin is and look at why people voted in Ireland the way they did, which is the most important thing, this is a breakthrough. And by the way, uh, 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 the person you were speaking about, uh, Turley, on his video, I mean, he said that, and he's absolutely right. And you know, he's a, as you said, a conservative person, as I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Does that mean that you might have the potential for some type of open door for a conservative right 
party to rise? Is there even a structure in place, a mechanism for that? That's question number one. No, no, no. And question number two is how did, why does Sinn, Sinn Féin seem to drift towards this position? You said they, it sounds to me that they've changed their position, their oh, ideology no. and their beliefs many times yeah. over the decades. Why have they drifted into this, and I don't have a, a better word for it, this leftist populist type yeah. of position or leftist yeah. nationalist, depending on what uh, media you read or what analysts yeah. you're, you're following. I, th I think they've pretty much been described as a leftist populist or nationalist party. And, uh, and How I think, did they end up in this position? And, and I think they will remain so. Uh, I, I think now this is conclusively what they what they have become. But um, Sinn Féin has had a consist certain very consistent positions that one it is against. Uh, it is for a united Ireland entirely independent of Britain. It has tended to be uh, a, a very very hostile to Britain. That you know. That being its tradition, it's also tended to be, as I've said many times, an anti-imperialist party. It has been in its past, at times, a Catholic right-wing nationalist party. It became a left-wing nationalist party because, in, and this, this is a complicated story, but because during the conflict in Northern Ireland, when the decision was made by its then leadership, in the 1980s that they would pitch towards a more political route towards achieving a united island and would try to give up on the violent terrorist struggle which they were fighting at that time which was going nowhere i mean it was actually they were going backwards and it was discrediting them uh, with the irish people and losing the support in, you know, even among sympathizers in Britain. When they took that decision, they looked for the opening that they could find as a party, the niche that they could occupy as a party, and that directed them to the left. It was and a conscious decision. It was a conscious decision, because as I said, that was also partly um, the background, the, you know, the, 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 the situation in Northern Ireland reflected this. I think what happened was, as I said, this was a nationalist pro-United pro Ireland party um, choosing to become, you know, to pitch itself to the left, which eventually morphed into a left-wing party. I mean, it, it, it kind of internalised it. And I don't think that's going to change. I think that is now the tradition. I, I should say that right here you go, all the way back to its origins in 1905, what makes it very confusing was that in those days, it was also for a time a very left-wing party. As I said, when they proclaimed the Irish Republic in uh, uh, um, 1916, um, in the, you know, there was there was the Easter uprising in Dublin. I mean, it was going to be the Socialist Republic, and uh, that they were they were all very much into that kind of thing at that time. Then, as I said, they swung to the right, and um, in the 1980s they swung they swung to the left. But I mean, it is clearly and definitively a left wing party now, and it would, if it ever became the government govern as a left-wing party and my prediction is that if that ever does happen that will be the moment when you will see a reaction and you will start to see a right-wing party mm. emerging in Ireland I mean because that's the way politics works I mean you have the left uh, when the left gets strong the right starts to get strong what you have at the moment what you had up to now in Ireland is neither a left nor a right, you had the European centre. And that isn't holding. It isn't holding in Ireland. It isn't holding in France. It isn't holding in Germany. It's broken, essentially, in Britain. And, of course, it's been rejected in Italy, in Hungary, in Poland. So that's, 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 the, that's, that's the, the main big, point. That's yeah. the main point. The centre cannot hold. In fact, there's a wonderful poem by Yeats, which I'm sure most of our view, many of our viewers know, because everybody talks about it, which actually talks about this, you know, that, uh, and it, it has this extraordinary phrase, you know, the centre cannot hold. Uh, uh, and in fact, it was written in response 
two events in Ireland way back in the 1920s. But the Eurocenter, the center, the Merkel center, if you like, is breaking down everywhere. In, it depends in particular parts of, the, of Europe whether the challenge comes from the left or from the right. Mostly, in most places, it is coming from the right because, frankly, the left in Europe is now just a broken, yeah. you know, dissolved thing. I mean, it, but in a few places, and Ireland is one, because of the particular history, it's coming from the left. How would you describe, moment. very quickly, how would you describe the, the political scene in Ireland to the UK, it, to, to Britain with relation to the Tories and Labour? Is there yeah. an equivalent? What's the closest to the Tories and what's the closest to like a Corbyn Labour? Well, I mean, Sinn Sinn Féin and and Corbyn Labour are very similar and they appeal to similar demographics. And of course, you have similar sort of politics in uh, 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 similar sort of policies for each of them. I mean, I would point out that Corbyn himself has been for nearly all his political life a Eurosceptic and uh, uh, was, um, you know, opposed by the Blairite centrists in his own party, they never trusted him, primarily for that reason. I mean, you know, I, I, I should know because I know I know people in the Labour Party, just as I know, by the way, people in the Conservative Party. But I know how, uh, you know, they were very suspicious of Corbyn because of his past history of Euroscepticism, which everybody knows he internally still still has. He was never able to express it. He was too weak to express it. Um, but there is that similarity and there is that overlap. And if you're talking about internal British politics, you have a, uh, um, I, I suspect the Corbynites within the Labour Party will take some encouragement from Sinn Féin's victory in, in, um, in um, Ireland. Now, if you're talking about the right, um, Fianna Foyle, Fianna, Fianna Gael are essentially the Conservative Party of David Cameron and Theresa May. I mean, that's what they Boris are. Boris Johnson, maybe, even though it's that a little early be, now. And but... It might be, and I think to some extent they are. I, mean, I think that's precisely true. There is no Nigel Farage in Ireland. And okay, I mean, now that, take... that's, yeah. that's, that's the fundamental difference. There is no Nigel Farage figure in Ireland, and it would be difficult for the moment to see that, actually. But, you know, couple of years from now, all will change. I okay, predict. taking a step back and to wrap up the video, Alexander, how is the EU uh, looking at this situation? How is Boris Johnson looking at this situation? How is Northern Ireland looking at the situation? Mm. Like we said, they're trying to form a government now. You've given your thoughts as to whether they're going to succeed or not. How mm. do you think on a geopolitical level, EU, Boris, <laughs> Northern Ireland, how do you think they're they're kind of watching on here as as we're seeing this unfold in Ireland? Well, I think the EU will not be pleased. And I mean, again, I, I should say I, I know people who were pretty close to that world. So uh, I, I know what their feelings are going to be. They're not going to be pleased about this. They had seen Ireland as this entirely loyal uh, uh, a trooper that would, you know, follow orders unquestioningly. Um, and now what they discover is that there's instability in Ireland, which they never expected. And um, they don't really know how to, uh, uh, how, how it will play out. Um, they will be hoping, and I think they're right to hope, that they'll be right, they'll, they're, this hope will be a justified one, that, that Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil patch something together and form a new government and freeze um, and freeze uh, Sinn Féin out. And I think that's probably, that's my guess, that is what's going to happen. Um, I mean, the thing about the EU, as we've discussed so many times on our programs, is they they don't learn, they don't understand that, you know, if even in a place like Ireland, which has been so loyal to the EU, they are facing problems. That means that there is something fundamentally wrong with the whole project. They, they won't learn from that. What they will try to do is they'll try to kick the can down the road, as they recently did in Italy, where, as I said, they patched up this ludicrous coalition between the Democratic Party and the Five Star Movement, which is now in, 
you know, gradually starting to fall apart there too. And they were trying to do the same with Ireland. If we're talking about uh, 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 Britain, Britain is in a complicated situation because, of course, the British are trying to, uh, well, they're, 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 they've, they've left the European Union and they're in the middle of trade negotiations with the European Union. I think that Boris Johnson will not welcome this result because from his point of view, um, he's going to find that with the Irish, um, he's going to have more difficulty trying to get an agreement on the Irish border issues that uh, than he would otherwise have done. Because even if we get a Fine Gael or Fine Foyle part government, which I predict we will, I think they will they will be more aggressive in pushing for Irish unity than they have been up to now. And that, of course, is something that Boris Johnson doesn't want, but may have to accept. I think Irish unity is going to as I said, as we discussed in the previous video, it's going to become a stronger force now. But the other major player in this within the United Kingdom is Scotland, where, of course, there is now a great deal of debate about whether or not to push for independence in Scotland. Scotland being a pro-EU region, but also pro-EU, by the way, in my opinion, not because people in Scotland are particularly in love with the EU, but because, you know, it's anti-English. It's an anti-English position, if you like. But there's been growing pro-independence sentiment in Scotland. If they now see, you know, the prospect of Irish um, unification and the United Kingdom losing Northern Ireland, which is now becoming a real possibility, then I think that will strengthen pro-independence feeling in Scotland. And that will be very difficult for Boris Johnson. I think the Conservatives in Britain, in London, can accept the loss of Northern Ireland. I mean, it won't be easy for them, but they can accept it. Boris Johnson has already shown that he's prepared to accept it. But I think for them to lose Scotland, um, I think that would be a shock. And I think people like Nigel Farage wouldn't be too bothered because they're happy, you know, they say England is 87% of the United Kingdom and is by far the richest part of the United Kingdom. Let us be free, let us be an independent and strong country as England, and that is fine. But the political class in London, which is pro-EU still, pro-globalist uh, uh, still will not be happy if it loses Scotland because they will feel that they have lost face and they've lost weight and traction. So, you know, it's it's a complicated thing for the British. Is the Irish economy really that shaky? I mean well, this is the funny thing. You see, it's one of those economies which to all outward appearances, it's doing incredibly well. I mean, you know, Ireland has achieved extraordinary growth over the last 30 years. Um, the trouble is, it's very unbalanced. What I hear is that it's based an awful lot on debt and it's based on very, very much on very, very large capital inflows. So it's, it's outwardly very strong, but also simultaneously very shaky as was exposed very brutally during the 2008 financial crisis. Um, Ireland has never really got over the financial crisis. I mean, the economic numbers are glowing, but, but people in Ireland, the way people feel in Ireland is, is that they feel that it's not really as stable as it appears. And the fact that the housing market is so unbalanced is a, is a strong sign of the extent to which capital inflows are, are distorting the appearance of the economy. Same is true in Britain, by the way. It's because we are this you know, place where people pour money pours into. Um, it, it, it inflates house, house uh, prices. Governments like the, yeah, you know, the government in London and the government in Dublin then go on to prop up and encourage rises in house prices even more because that makes the economy look even stronger and attracts more capital inflow and pleases older people 
who own these houses, who see them rising. But it, it, it leads for an ever more unbalanced economy. And it explains why people, young people in particular, feel so dissatisfied. It's the reason, along with uh, along in Britain with student fees, why the young people in Britain have become so radicalised and voted for Jeremy Corbyn in such numbers. And it's also the reason why in Ireland they voted for Sinn Féin. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's the same dynamic at work. But, you know, every, as, as has been often said, all is connected. And it's also part of Ireland's role within the EU. And can I just say something, you know, I, you know I, I've, I've got to know Ireland quite well over the last year. And one of the things I've discovered is that the political conversation in Ireland is pretty sophisticated. This is a well-educated country. People are very well informed. They are historically extremely well informed. And perhaps there's a rather keener understanding of the way these things play out than you, than you would expect and you often find in England itself. So um, in Ireland, somebody who's you know 25 and struggling understands perhaps rather better the sort of overall overarching structure and the role that the EU plays in it than perhaps would be the case in England. Very worrying what you said about the housing market. And one downturn to occur and the whole thing could just pop. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as happened, in, yeah. yeah, as happened disastrously in two thousand eight in Ireland. I mean, it, it really did. I mean, the entire Irish banking system almost collapsed, and the 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 EU came along and bailed it out and uh, did all the usual things. It imposed stringent austerity policies, um, and a, a, a lot of people were very very badly hurt, burnt um, as a result. Then what happened was, as the economies, the world economies recovered. With QE and all that, uh, you know, capital inflation. If they really recovered, well, if they really recovered, yeah. but in a sense that there is that kind of recovery. It may not be a very, it may be a very synthetic recovery, but the fact that all this money was being generated, you know, created out of thin air, a lot of it has ended up in Ireland because of the structure of the economy there. But it has meant that the underlying problems that caused the smash in 2008 has never been fixed fascinating all right yeah. the world is watching Alexander. the world is watching yeah. ireland is an interesting country i mean it's it's small i mean it's only a couple of million people uh but it it, it makes the weather and um as i said it, it will certainly have a domino effect on britain and as i said the eu won't be pleased all right, and, and its politics are evolving. Just, <laughs> yeah, that's, just, just to finish, absolutely. You know, it is a breakthrough. It's not. It's the start. It's the breaking of the ice, if you like. It's. No, it doesn't mean that this is what's going to happen. As I said, if Sinn Fein does form a government, which I predict, perhaps one day it will, then you will see a right wing reaction in Ireland also. But at the moment, you know, the the centre. Is still very uh, 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 is still very is still very much in control, uh, and it's not allowed space for a right wing party to emerge. I think we both understand the situation in Ireland mm -hmm. very very well because we're going through the same situation in Greece. Well, we've waited well, how many decades for a real viable conservative right party? Well, well, there you go. You know, I, it's, I, it's, I, always I, been, it's always been center and center left. Yeah. Well, indeed. Absolutely. Well, we will see what happens in Ireland. But as I said, uh, if you want change in Ireland, you really want change in Ireland. What you have to do is you have to if you have to overturn the centre, which has governed Ireland for decades. This this complete you know, this Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael block in the middle. You have to you have to get that out of the way, and then. You know, you may, you will have to have a, you may you will start to see a real politics emerge because in Ireland that's not what you really had up to now. It's interesting you say that, Alexander, because it's always been that center that has emerged that's become kind of this neoliberal center. Yeah, where maybe 20, 30 years ago, like you said, it wasn't like that. It was a little no. bit more center right. Yeah. Even in Germany, the video we did on Germany, oh, absolutely. even though that center, Angela Merkel has drifted that conservative right CDU to the center absolutely. as well, in much the same way that 
you know, we've seen the left also move to the center. And then you've, and you've got this big, massive neoliberal core now all over Europe. And that's collapsing absolutely, everywhere. Absolutely. Exactly. Because ultimately it has no answers. It's exhausted. It has no, uh, it has no fresh ideas. As I said, its only solution is to vilify its opponents by calling them all populists and claiming that democracy is at risk, which is nonsense. And at the same time, uh, 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 kick the can down the road, which is what it always does. It always finds a way to sort of patch up things and manipulate the process in some way, you know, setting up coalitions, uh, uh, you know, working things through the back stairs. And then of course it's astonished when that in the end doesn't work in Britain, it didn't work, but they tried very hard last year. If you remember, we spent all those yeah. hours going through it. But, you know, in the end, um, popular forces are rising against them right across Europe. And even Germany is cracking now. Even Germany is cracking. And yeah. the U.S. is probably the most popular example of it cracking oh. with Trump. But Trump, oh. once again, was someone who smashed the center, but he did it from the, yeah, well, from the right. Yeah. He, did, he did it from the right. And I would say, by the way, that one of the reasons, I mean, you, you, again, I, I'm, I'm not taking sides, but what I'm simply saying is this, because you have a Trump, you perhaps have, you perhaps have a Bernie Sanders. That's right. not to say, I, you know, I'm going to vote. It's a counterbalance. Yeah. It, it creates, a, and it also, if I may say, what it also does is it brings back politics. If you have centrists in power all the time, what the Italians call transformismo. You don't have politics. And without politics, you don't have democracy. You don't have, you people are not able to, to have the kind of policies that they want. So to give an example, I know this is an issue that I, some of our people on our threads get very exercised about, immigration policies. You can't have an immigration policy if you're a member of the EU because it decides, the EU decides it for you. <laughs> you think about it. I mean, that's 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 how it works. Uh, so if if you really want to change, if you want if you want to have a, a country with a proper immigration policy, you have to have a sovereign country. You're not going to get that unless you have politics in your own country, which could challenge all of this. Um, Ireland has not had that kind of politics up to now. Excellent point. Alexander Mercurius, Editor-in-Chief of The Durant. Thank you very much, guys. If you like this video, click the subscribe button down below. Click on the notifications bell. Smash that like button. Please donate to us on PayPal, Patreon, and subscribe. Star, your donation helps keep this channel up and running. And please go to The Durant Shop. Pick up some merchandise, some magic mugs, and some awesome t-shirts. Whether you're on the left... Or the right, or, or in the, the center. Right. <laughs> or in the center. Well, indeed, yes. Well, maybe may, may, may not so much the center because, you know, I wonder how many centrists come to our program. Yeah, that's, 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 <laughs> that's another story. Hardly any. That's another story. Maybe to report anyway. it to YouTube. I don't know. Yeah, to flag us. But... Absolutely. Possibly. Possibly. Indeed so. But that's the point. I mean, you know, if you want to support us, then, as I said, because we have all kinds of problems with all the sort of, you know, the, the centre, if you like, the centre has never been very keen on what we do on the Duran. And you can support us by coming to our shop. That's one way of supporting us and buying our, 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 thing, our, our merchandise in our shop. And we've made a specific point to go for very high quality merchandise. Our mugs, for example, which we've talked about many times and which we're hugely proud of, they could not be a better quality than these. I mean, these are the best coffee tea mugs you can find. And I say that without any doubt, hesitation or uh, uh, apology. They are exceptional. They are beautifully made. They're, they're wonderful porcelain body. They have this extraordinary luster. They keep your tea or coffee or hot chocolate really warm. Um, they don't chip or crack. Um, I've had this one now for almost a year and it's as good as new. You can see there's no discoloration, no cracks or chips, no nothing. And uh, for those who are interested, the badge there is the coat of arms of the Russian Federation, as you will find on Vladimir Putin's mugs uh but these are better mugs than his of that i am quite sure and it's not just our mugs which are superb so are our shirts all 100 percent cotton you have long sleeve t-shirts like the one i'm wearing now which are also incredibly comfortable 
um, incredibly warm on a cold blustery day but if you want to if you've got a hot day we've also got short sleeve t-shirts also 100 percent cotton of similar quality we've got v-neck shirts and we've also got of course our amazing and fabulous polo shirts which are the epitome of smart casual we don't just have shirts we also have hoodies and hats and stickers we're now also really starting to work on developing our ebooks you will already find four great ebooks on our top on various topics which we've discussed in our videos also in our shop so you support us by going to our shop you will be the proud owner of these great things you will be helping the duran and you'll be spreading the message so don't hold back come to our shop support the duran be the proud owner of these great things alex will tell you how go to the duranshop.com you will find a link in the description box down below alexander mercurse editor-in-chief of the duran thank you very much until next time everybody take care